A shout out to GTQN for requesting this case. And I do have to warn you, it's a serious heartbreaker. Seriously, go forth with caution. It is not for the faint hearted. There is a lot of information before the incident, so bear with it. Trust me, I've dumbed out as much information as I can. Everything that I've left in is what I deem to be relevant. The disclaimers come on this video probably more than any other. This is a true crime case. It involves real people, and then real people have families. So although I do want you to share it, and I do want you to comment, please do be sensitive as you do so. This case starts in March 2009 with Fiona Anderson. She was 19 year old and she was pregnant with her first baby. However, during this pregnancy, she wasn't being very cooperative and very responsive with her midwife. She weren't attending a neonatal appointments and that would have spite the midwife's numerous attempts to try and contact her and try and encourage her to join in and come to the appointments, obviously. So in June 2009, the midwifery service referred Fiona to the Children and Young People Service. From here on out, I'm just going to call them Children's Services, just because it's easier, and we do talk about them a lot. Apparently, this referral weren't only because of Fiona's poor attendance to the neonatal things. They also noticed a vulnerability, a difficult family background, and a low mood. As well as the referral, a cause for serious concern she was also given to health visitors. In response to these concerns, a social worker who was actually a student social worker, was allocated the case. They did manage to directly contact the family, but it weren't on the first attempt. This was the third attempt of trying to contact the family before they were successful, and that was on the 29th of June, 2009. The child services held an initial child protection conference on Monday the 13th of July, 2009. Now, as the name suggests, that's a meeting where they basically discuss what the issues are, and how they could protect the child, usually resulting in a child protection plan. Apparently this meeting weren't only held because of a poor attendance, it was also because of some prior knowledge about both parents suggesting the parenting capacity would be limited. Both Fiona and the parents' dad were invited to attend the conference, but neither of them attended. Not only that, but later that evening, a police officer and a social worker attended their house, and Fiona refused to speak to them. Apparently the baby's dad did have a conversation with him, but I can't be quite sure how much of a conversation that were or how long it went on for. It's likely the reason that they were visiting were to tell Fiona and the baby's dad what had been decided at the conference. And what had been decided was to put the child under a child protection plan. The next day, a legal strategy meeting were held, and that's quite obvious what that is by its name. And the legal advice given in that meeting was the threshold for care proceedings were met. So the plan was for an interim care order. That basically means that when this baby is born, they're going to try and take it and put it into foster care. If they get the interim care order, that is exactly what will happen. Now this isn't a permanent thing, it's temporary. Up to eight weeks. They put the baby into foster care and they assess whether the parents are capable of looking after the child. Or alternatively, they look for alternative carers. We really need to stop calling it baby. She's called Lavina. So that was on the 13th and 14th of July, 2009. The day after that, the Wednesday the 15th of July, both the parents were subject to a mental health assessment at their home. That concluded saying that Fiona didn't have depression, nor did she have anxiety, and Fiona herself was saying, look, I've never had them symptoms. I'm perfectly fine. Now, at this time, Fiona and her boyfriend are getting really unhappy about the child services interference, and they were really unhappy about the style of intervention. Now, the style of intervention was they were having frequent visits to their house, and they were even having their food cupboards checked. Bear in mind, this was before Baby Lavina's even been born. Baby Lavina was finally born on the 21st of July, 2009. And when she were, child services formally requested that the parents agree to a voluntary agreement. This agreement was that Lavina would be placed into care but the parents refused, and I can't blame them. They weren't the only people that disagreed. Three days later, on the 24th of July, which was a Friday, the interim care order was refused in court. It was refused on the basis that there were insufficient evidence of concerns to warrant separating Lavina from her mom. As an alternative, an agreement was written up. 
This agreement basically said that the parents would cooperate with professionals, as well as allowing assessments of their parenting capacity. Then a report in August 2009 stated that there were no concerns for Lavina's health. Fiona cooperated sufficiently with professionals, and the local authority should provide assistance to support Fiona. At this point, Lavina's guardian stated that she was unclear about what child services concerns were, and whether the, the actual criteria for care proceeds were being met. Now, I looked that up, and a guardian is basically someone that's qualified in social work, and they're appointed by the court to act in best interest of a child. They're basically an unbiased middleman. They don't act for the parents, they don't act for the system, they act solely for the child and what's best for them, but they know the law surrounding it. And may I add as well, up to this point, the assessments have said everything's fine and everything else has been fine. Up to this point, the only reason that they're in all this trouble is because they haven't gone to antenatal. Now, I'm not saying antenatal appointments aren't important and it shouldn't be followed up like that. But I think it's a bit extreme to try and take the baby away from them. And obviously the judge agreed in court. Now you've even got a guardian saying, why, why are you pestering the family? Just leave them alone. And I want to clarify, the guardian didn't say no child protection plans. They just said the care proceeds, which basically means the legal part of it. The part where it's really serious. Anyway, come August 2009, the meeting felt that Fiona should have a mental health assessment. Bearing in mind, this was only six weeks after she had the first one. So an appointment was set up for the 25th of August with a mental health link worker. But Fiona didn't attend. And she outright demanded that, look, I haven't got postnatal depression. I'm perfectly fine. Leave me alone. Then a couple more weeks down the line, in early September 2009, Lavina was admitted to hospital following concerns about a low weight. However, three days later, she'd gained enough weight and was discharged from hospital. I want to point out something really important to the case here. During them three days, Fiona stayed by Lavina's side the entire time. She didn't leave the hospital. And there were actually different views about Lavina's weight gain. The information was very conflicting about the levels of concern. So there is a good chance that actually she weren't dangerously low on weight. She was just a little bit below the threshold. And as a parent, I can say in the UK, health workers press on this a lot. We were told my first daughter was too fat, and then we were told that my second daughter was too thin. Both were perfectly healthy, and we still are perfectly healthy to this day. Now with both Fiona and baby Lavina at home, they're still hard to contact. And child services at this point thought that they had evidence that the parents were actively avoiding them. To the extent that only 6 out of 12 parental assessments were attended by the 11th of September. Now we need to hold off again there because that sounds really bad. They've only attended six out of 12, but this is September, the 11th of September. So it's not even been three months since Lavina were born and they've already supposed to have had 12 assessments. I'm sorry, but that is a lot of pressure to put under a new mom under. Again, I'm not saying it's never necessary. I just think that this is a massive overreaction. In October 2009, with Lavina being three months old, the family made a formal request for child services to support them financially and avoid them from being evicted from their home. However, they failed to provide necessary financial details, so they never got any financial support. That led to them being evicted and they moved in with some friends. At some point after that, they moved out of the friend's house into Lavina's grandparents. November 2009 marked the fifth and final court hearing. And it was here that the local authority applied to withdraw from care proceedings. They were happy that Lavina's needs would be met and everything were okay. However, there were still concerns around the housing situation, especially with them moving about a bit at that time. And the Guardian did agree that the family was in need of support. So although care proceedings should be withdrawn, the child protection plans should remain. So that's what happened. The care proceedings were dropped and child protection plans continued. I think from there on, pretty much everything went as expected. But then another seven months on, they were having more housing issues. They were evicted for having rent arrears, so they went to live with a relative, who then wrote them a letter of eviction by the 5th of July, 2010. However, that eviction didn't happen, and on the 11th of June, 2010, Fiona gave birth to another baby. This baby was called Addy. Now, it's in my notes here, and I'm not quite sure if it's a typo made by the Serious Case Review, 
or whether it's correct and it's just placed in a strange place. But apparently on the end of July 2011, which is the following year, the dad of the children, Fiona's boyfriend, made a homeless application to the housing department. Like I said, I'm not sure if that's a different time or not, but by August 2010, it was apparent that the family was sofa surfing. They were living with another family who'd previously been assessed by professionals as unsuitable. There were concerns that they were living in unkept conditions and it weren't a really safe place for them to be. At some point thereafter, Fiona and her two children moved into some council temporary accommodation and the father didn't move with them. He moved into an hostel. Now that could, and I imagine it is, because it's much easier for a woman, for children, and a woman with children to get somewhere to stay. Not only is there loads more places for women and children, but they're obviously a priority as well. So I imagine that's why they were separated, although I don't know that is just me speculating. Now, during this time, child services were back involved because of the housing difficulties. But then they closed the case when Fiona and the kids moved into this temporary accommodation. But the housing department didn't see that as clear case closed. They saw that as its temporary accommodation. So maybe that was an oversight. Three months on in November 2010, Fiona complained that the children's dad was outside. He was refusing to leave and he was being aggressive. A strategy discussion between the police and the child services were held, but they decided there were no further action needed. The next month in December 2010, Fiona and her two children moved to a new accommodation in Lowestoft. But then two months later in February, they moved to another location. But this was still in Lowestoft and this is where they stayed. They gained some stability in this house and they didn't move again. Just as things are starting to seem okay. It's now been three months without any major issues. Then on the 28th of May 2011, some unknown person reported Fiona raising concerns of neglect. They were claiming that the children slept in a double push chair for 13 nights and ate only biscuits. Now, I want to point out here that just because someone's made a claim doesn't mean it's true. Quite often, in a lot of places, people use these types of claims as spite. They do it as an attack on the person. So, although I'm not saying it's not true, it doesn't mean it is true just because it's been said. So, two days after this report, Child Services did an initial assessment. That didn't go very far though. Fiona agreed to take the children to a local children's centre and then Child Services closed the case. Again, that to me just says that they weren't an issue and it was probably a fake call. But I do think that sending Fiona to this children's centre was the best thing that the Child Services did in this entire case. It's a place where there's actual family workers there, the professionals that know what they're doing. They can keep an eye on Fiona without Fiona feeling like she's been watched and checked up on all the time. There's also other parents and other children. It's, in my opinion, the best thing they did for so many different reasons. Then on the 27th of June 2011, a month after that complaint of neglect, there was another domestic abuse incident. Fiona had phoned the police claiming that the children's dad had pushed her while holding Lavina. When the police went round, they noted that the flat were in reasonable condition. But they said that the children looked malnourished and they were tired with full nappies. Adding that there were bits of bread on the floor, the only thing in the fridge was a large carton of milk and a dry loaf of bread. The day after, there was a visit from a social worker and the day after that, there was a visit from a family support worker from the children's centre. During one of those two visits, it was reported that the children were play pens for long periods with little stimulation. They were both silent and Lavina looked very thin. The support of the nurse who offered to Fiona, but she turned it down. And strangely, her reasoning behind that was because she didn't want the children to be exposed to abuse of an explicit nature. I don't want to say that whole sentence together because YouTube, basically. But I'm sure you understand what I mean. But keep that in mind, because that issue, that level of trust, does come back up again in the future. A few weeks on, in early July 2011, a health visitor reported that when she'd been round to the home, the children were again in the playpens, but while she was there, Fiona did take the children out to feed them. She reported that Lavina had lost weight for the second month, and Ada had also lost a little bit of weight. She also stated that she was concerned about the children's social and emotional development. So with that in mind, she made a referral to the speech and language therapy. On the 11th of July 2011, 
a professional meeting took place. No idea what occurred in that, but it was on that day that Fiona took Lavina to A&E, at a local hospital. The reason for her going was she wanted Lavina checked over because of her poor weight gain. The doctor, who basically said Lavina were perfectly fine, there was nothing wrong with her, said that Fiona looked really distressed and she talked non-stop. They were really concerned about her anxiety. So as a result, this doctor informed the emergency duty service of child services. By the 13th of July 2011, a health visitor made a referral to a paediatric assessment for the children. I don't know when this assessment took place, but it was reported that the children were both cheerful and happy and all were well during this assessment. Two days after the referral had been made, a strategic discussion took place again. This time it was concerns for the children's health and because of a recent domestic incident. Although by this time, Fiona's now saying that she wants to get back with her children's father and she wants to have another child, another baby. The strategy discussion ended with calling for a new initial child protection conference. It was decided to make the two children subject to child protection plans again, but this time it would be under the category of neglect. The initial conference was on the 3rd of August 2011 and again neither of the parents attended. However, it were reported there that the children were attending the children's centre and while they were there they were presented well, they were clean and they were playing. On the 5th of August 2011, a health visitor and a social worker visited the home together to discuss the child protection plan. While there they noted that the children were playing with the father quite nicely and Fiona talked incessantly. And at this point Fiona makes it very clear that she's offended by the accusations of neglect and the suggestions that she weren't a good mom and she said that she felt victimised. There was another legal strategy meeting and the legal advice given in this meeting was that if Fiona failed to engage with the children's services, children's medical appointments, then there'd be another interim care order, or at least another interim care order should be seeked, immediately it said. Which means, again, they're going to try and take the children off her. But again, the parents failed to attend meetings, the child services were only getting limited engagement from them, so on the 20th of September 2011, a letter was sent to them that basically said, look, we're concerned about your non-engagement, if your engagement doesn't pick up with us, then we will have to once again seek legal advice. At this point, Fiona's now pregnant with a third baby, and on the 31st of October 2011, during a child protection review, it was decided that not only would Lavina and Ade stay part of the plan, but the new baby would also be added to it. In November 2011, it was thought that Fiona would benefit from a psychological assessment due to her own childhood experiences and how it affects her parenting. During 2012, the usual cycle occurred. Child services were struggling to get in contact with them, so the meetings would be held and so on and so forth. The third child, Caden, was born on the 11th of May 2012. Apologies if I've pronounced that wrong. And as soon as Caden was born, they were added straight to the protection plans. The need for Fiona to have a psychological assessment was discussed again in January 2012, as well as again in June, and then again a review in November. I think the one in November was actually in regards to both parents. They were suggesting that both parents should have a psychological assessment. And just a reminder that the psychological assessment isn't like looking for depression and mental illness. This is basically looking for what happened in their childhood and how it affects their parenting. But during 2012, there were a few quite big failures by the system. First of all, a pre-birth assessment was cancelled because it didn't happen in time. Then, a legal strategy meeting was supposed to take place, but after a core assessment. And that core assessment were never completed, so the legal strategy meeting never occurred. When home visits did actually happen in 2012, Fiona apparently talked incessantly about the child's services, and her anger towards them, and that she had distrust for social workers. Now, I'm completely torn here. I can completely understand why she's angry at them, and why she doesn't trust them. Let's not forget, since she was 19, when she was first pregnant with Lavina, they were trying to take her off her, just because she weren't attending antenatal meetings. I'm not saying that's okay, and I'm not saying that shouldn't be followed up on. But it is a bit extreme. Now, if you also look at the time frame of these babies, for three years, she's had three children, and the social services have constantly been pressuring her. And yes, I know there was times where, for example, social services went round, the kids were in a playpen, the need of a nap is changing, 
But there might have been a simple explanation for that. For example, she might have just got back in from shopping or something. I'm not saying she was an amazing parent. I'm not saying she was a bad parent. I weren't there, you weren't there, we don't know. But all of this report seems to be extreme. And I can completely understand if and why Theona feels like they're constantly waiting for her to trip up. Now, with all the hormones of pregnancy, imagine all this constant pressure. Add a little bit of postnatal depression in there. She must feel so trapped, so alone, so exhausted, so desperate. Again, I weren't there. I'm not saying that is how it is. I don't know. But to me, it really does feel like that they need to back off her and give her the help that she needs rather than just trying to say you either do a good job or we take the children. Early on in 2012, her health visit determined the children needed a paediatric assessment. They failed to attend the assessment. But on the 21st of February 2012, a community paediatrician saw the children and assessed the children. They said that they were meeting all the development milestones. Although they did say they had slight concerns about Lavina's social and interactive skills, and that Addy was slightly quiet, so he was possibly concerned about his vocal development. And this paediatrician basically said, look, I recommend Lavina, who's now two and a half year old, should go to a nursery placement. An additional comment by the paediatrician was made, and it was that Fiona seemed to be far more concerned about her needs than the children's now okay that could be narcissism it could be being a bad mom but if we look at what's going on through his case already it could also be a cry for help it could also be fiona saying look i need help again i went there i don't know by the end of 2012 the system became aware that fiona was pregnant with a fourth child into 2013 fiona agreed to have adult attachment interviews and I look this up and it's basically where you sit down and you get interviewed. Interviewed about your upbringing and stuff. Very much like the psychological assessments basically. They talk about your upbringing and stuff and then they look at how that's affecting your parenting. The alternative to that was a psychiatric assessment. And then just like in 2012, during January and February, there were plans to have a legal strategy meeting as a matter of urgency. But they didn't go ahead. On the 23rd of January 2013, Lavinia started a new nursery. Bearing in mind, she's now three and a half year old. While she was at this new nursery, she told one of the staff that she wasn't allowed to touch her and that she was a bad lady, just like the lady in her old school. She said, They did bad things to my body. My mommy says ladies should never do bad things to me. This was looked into, and it turns out Fiona had moved Lavinia from this nursery because she'd sustained cuts and bruises. But obviously, the nursery challenged that. Fiona and the dad's relationship were further strained during 2013. Fiona was complaining about the lack of parental help from the dad, and by March 2013, the dad reported that the couple were no longer talking, saying that she was jealous of him spending more time with another local person. Fiona then reported that they'd separated, and the father did confirm this, saying that he went round every day to give the children lunch. A family support worker who had been allocated the case earlier that year went round to the house on the 4th of April 2013. She reported that there were no concerns identified, but Fiona did say that the children were spending a lot of time out of the house with her dad, and that Fiona was up a lot during the night because the children kept waking up. So 10 days on, during the afternoon of the 14th of April 2013, the father reported to the police that he'd been to their house, he'd give the children lunch, and they left in the evening stating that he told Fiona that she needed to accept that their relationship was over and he was in a relationship with another woman. At five minutes past eight that night, he called an ambulance. He'd been stabbed by an unknown man on Mill Road. Because in the initial statement to the police, he said he was in the vicinity of Fiona's flat, they thought it might be linked to a domestic dispute. So they went round to Fiona. They spoke to her through the intercom. She refused to come downstairs. She refused to let them upstairs. And she basically said, look, I haven't seen him for about a month. Then, a couple hours after, at 20 past 6 in the morning, Fiona went round to the hostel where the dad was staying and handed in her keys to the flat for him to collect. Then, just before 9am, 23-year-old, heavily pregnant Fiona Anderson was found on the ground outside of Battery Green multi-storey car park in Lowestoft. She was dead. She had all four of her children's names written on her body. Yes, she'd written Eve for the unborn child. Two hours later that morning, 
The three children were found in the flat, in bed, all of which were deceased. So what on earth happened? Well, it didn't take long for that information to start coming forward. Later that day, the children's dad informed the police that it was Fiona that had stabbed him. Apparently, they were having a dispute about the separation, and Fiona said, look, if you want to be with her, that's fine, but you're not having access to the children. Going on to explain that the reason he lied to the police is he wanted to protect Fiona and prevent the children from going to care. He then went on to explain that after he'd been stabbed and while he was in the hospital, he texts Fiona saying, look, I've said it were a man, I've said it weren't you, so hide the knife and deny everything. He was then discharged from hospital, but before that, Fiona had phoned his accommodation. She sounded upset and angry about the situation with him. She explained to the hospital staff that no one were helping her and that people were trying to take her children away. They offered Fiona the number of the Samaritans, but she refused to take it. Upon entry to Fiona's flat the next morning, the police found writing on the wall. At the top, there was a big heart with I love you wrote inside, and in green marker pen just below it, it said, I put them to bed with their bear bears. They love their bears. I love them. I'm going to keep them safe. They could have looked together sleeping. They look so peaceful. They're happy and safe and can't hurt again. The last words they heard was I love you. I love them and I'm going to keep them safe. Bury us together. We need to stay together. I need to look after them and keep them safe. All three of the deceased children were found in Fiona's bed, tucked up together with the teddy bears. On first examination, it was found that the children each had I love you writ on their torsos. Then, traces of lipstick were found on their foreheads, suggesting that Fiona would give them all a kiss on the head goodnight after she put them to bed. But it was only later on that the post-mortem found that each of the children had died by a drowning. They'd been drowned in the bath. None of them had been restrained, and none of them had been assaulted. So it's evident that Fiona had drowned her three children, tucked them all up in bed together with their teddies, and gave them a kiss goodnight. She then left the flat, dropped the keys off at the hostel. She was then seen on CCTV walking around the streets of Lowsoft, clutching a teddy bear for 90 minutes. Just before 8 o'clock that morning, she entered the car park. At half past 8, 23-year-old, heavily pregnant Fiona Anderson jumped off a battery green multi-storey car park. The post-mortem confirmed that Fiona had died of severe head injuries consistent with a fall from a height. The night before, she posted on Facebook saying, I would never do anything to hurt my kids. I just want to keep them safe and happy. So many people tried to hurt them and make them sad, but I'll never let that happen again. I'll never leave them. I'll always love all four of them more than words can describe. I'll always be with them, keeping them safe. The people who are supposed to help us just tell lies and try to take my babies away. Apparently, her last upload to Facebook was the upload of a picture of an ultrasound scan. A police officer found a torn up letter in a flat and he said it provided a harrowing insight to her life. She felt unable to cope with the situation and apologetically outlined her intention to take the children with her. In her words, her mother never abandons her children. Three days after their deaths, on the 18th of April 2013, the police confirmed that they weren't looking for anyone else in connection to the tragic deaths. On the 19th of April, an inquest was opened into their deaths. Also, an evening vigil was held and lanterns were released on the beach. On the 22nd of April, Lostoft fell silent for a minute. On the 3rd of May, Fiona's parents appealed and pled that the children should be buried with the mom. But on the 5th of June 2013, the funeral was held for Lavina, three and a half year old, Ada, two and a half year old, and Caden, 11 months old. Over a week later, on the 14th of June 2013, there was a funeral for Fiona. During the funeral, there was also a memorial for the children at the same time. Her dad said, It's not just a funeral for Fiona. We want it to be for all five of them. They should have never been broken up. She is overlooking her children. The plot is very close. Then heartbreakingly, on the 25th of October 2013, the children's dad spoke out for the first time. And that was to condemn the disgusting vandalism to the children's grave. He revealed that their resting place had been vandalised five times in just four months. So I think before we end this, it's important we look at the people who knew Fiona and what they said about her. Of course, first of all is her parents. Fiona was a beautiful, intelligent girl and a loving, caring person, but she'd suffered from mental illness since she was young and we believe she was driven to her actions. This was not our Fiona. She was not herself. She cared passionately about others, but often brought stress on herself by caring too much. 
She was gentle, but ended up under too much pressure. As a family we were close, but she would often push us away, keen to do her own thing, and not to listen when we offered support. Life was sometimes overwhelming for her. We wish more had been done to recognise her mental health problems. In an interview on the TV show Daybreak, her mum and dad said, You must understand, that was not our Fiona. Fiona would have never done anything to hurt her children. That evening, whatever happened, she had in her mind that she was looking after her children. She wanted to be with the children and look after them still. Everybody must understand that. Anyone who came into contact with Fiona knew what a wonderful mother she was. The last time we saw Fiona, she was happy. She was going to have two boys and two girls. She was a fantastic mom. She adored the children. She did not go out with her friends. She didn't do anything without her children. They were everything to her. But they weren't the only ones that said that she was a wonderful mom. A friend's sister said, She was friendly with my sister. She sent a Facebook message to her last night saying that she was down and had nobody to talk to. My sister said she would talk to her. Her kids are healthy and well brought up. Fiona was outgoing and friendly. She would talk to anyone and she was very laid back. But her boyfriend left her about a month or so ago. She was heavily pregnant with a baby girl due next month. She was a lovely person. She just didn't seem the sort of mother to do this. It is devastating that the three innocent little children have died. I thought she was a brilliant mother. She must have been going through a very tough time. We just can't believe it. More friends claimed that social services failed her when she went to them for help. They started investigating her and threatening to take away her children. The coroner seemed to agree. Here's what he said. It seems there were missed opportunities to engage with a non-engaging family. It was perhaps wise, instead of doing the same thing for 18 months, to stop what you're doing and see if there is a different way. Adding that he didn't want to imply liability, but the required steps were not approached to psychologically assess Fiona. He also said he was going to write to the health minister about the case, because it highlighted the need for more of awareness of parents with mental health issues and how to provide support for them. But there is one more person that has been affected more than anybody else. And that's the children's father. The pain that he must have felt, and very likely still does, is so unimaginable. It has got to be the worst thing on earth. He was a part of the reason that I almost didn't cover this case. My conscience call was majorly, don't do this. But then I realised why I do these videos. It's important to spread the message. It's important to get the word out. It's important to raise awareness. And that's why I've called him the children's father or the children's dad. I haven't said his name out of respect for his privacy and for him. Now you may have noticed I have used pictures with him in, but I've justified back to myself that they were 10 years old, so it won't look exactly like that anymore. But more importantly, I couldn't bring myself to edit the pictures, to blur them out. They are such meaningful pictures. Now, I mentioned awareness. Something that really annoys me with the depression of today is when someone says that's got depression, hey look, I'm really low. The response that we give them is, well if you ever need to talk, I'm here. Now what you need to understand with people with depression is, it's really hard to reach out. They don't want to reach out. Them saying, I'm really low, or I'm feeling really down, was them reaching out. You saying, ah, oh, well, you know where I am if you need to talk, is you saying, I ain't got time for you right now. When someone with depression tells you that they're feeling low, that is the time where you have to act. When someone has depression, it could be a meme. It could just be an I love you message. It could be a message saying that, look, remember, the light is at the end of a tunnel. You won't feel down all the time. It could just be going around and having a cup of coffee. It could be anything, just some interaction to know that they're not alone, to know that they are loved, they are wanted and they are appreciated. Do not, do not fob it off. Do not say, I'm here if you need me, because they will not come. You have to go to them. That is the worst thing about depression. Second of all, it said in the serious case review, um, well, it turns out that she might not have been honest during the interviews about depression. Y you think... Do you think that? This mother, who you're trying to take the baby off before it's even born, might lie to make things look okay? You think that might be the case? The problem with that system, 
of an interview will tell us, a survey will tell us if you have depression, if you have postnatal depression, is the result will be as truthful as the answers given. And when someone's scared of you taking the baby off them, that is enough incentive to lie. So it's important that we know and recognise the symptoms of postnatal depression. So here they are off the NHS website. The NHS says you might feel these symptoms in the first two weeks of giving birth. It's quite common. They're called baby blues. After that, if after two weeks these symptoms aren't letting up, if these symptoms are still there, then you should contact help. A persistent feeling of sadness and low mood. A lack of enjoyment and loss of interest in the wider world. Lack of energy and feeling tired all the time. Trouble sleeping at night and feeling sleepy during the day. Finding it difficult to look after yourself and your baby. Withdrawing from contact with other people. Problems with concentrating and making decisions. Frightening thoughts, for example, about hurting your baby. The NHS also points out that many parents don't realise that they have postnatal depression because it can develop gradually. And it is very, very important for me that you know that having postnatal depression doesn't make you a bad mom. And in the UK especially, having postnatal depression doesn't mean they will take your children off you. So don't be scared to get help. Don't be scared to come forward. The longer you leave it, potentially the worse it'll get. Now those of you that have got a partner who's recently had a baby, let's not be fooled because there is lots and lots of months ahead for recovery. My missus, she seems perfectly fine. Straight out of it, straight done, we're all good. But there's a lot of things going on inside. There's a lot of hormones running about. There's a the baby brain is an actual thing, guys. So do not at any point just assume because everything seems okay that everything's okay. Even if them symptoms don't come up, let's still be a little bit patient, a little bit caring of each other, supportive of each other, and know what's happening. As always, there is links in my description regarding postnatal depression for the three most popular viewing countries. The final thing I want to say is I know all you parents are now going to go and give your children the world's biggest hugs. I know for this week I have been. <laughs> I've been in so many hugs. But let's make sure that we do. Because I think we underestimate how much every interaction with a child affects their development, affects their growing up, affects their adult life. The stimulation, the love, the care really does help their development. And it really does affect not only how they'll be as an adult, but how they'll be as a parent. All I'm saying is, I love you all. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And I'll see you next week.